Hello and welcome to Tony Broom Ministries. Thank you for stopping by to listen to another teaching session from God's Holy Word. Our scriptures are taken from Luke chapter 24, John chapter 20, chapter 21, and our golden text verse is Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Let's join the session now entitled, Experiencing the Resurrection. Our session today is entitled, Experiencing the Resurrection. Praise God for the resurrection. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Because Christ is alive, we can experience a personal relationship with the Lord. If He is not risen, we are of all men most miserable. We are still in our sins. Our faith is vain. Preaching is vain. Church is vain. All for naught if Christ is is not risen. I'm glad to know that He is risen. And I'm glad to know that He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. He sits on that throne. And He's never changed. Always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Our golden text is not from John or Matthew or Luke, Mark. Our golden text is Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. This verse starts off by saying that I may know him. You might say, well, certainly our apostle Paul knows the Lord. If anybody knows the Lord, Paul knows the Lord. He said, yeah, I know the Lord, but that I may know him. I already know him. But I really want to know Him. And that's the way that we ought to be. Not just to know Him. Not just to be a little bit acquainted with Him. The New Testament even says the demons, the devils know Him in that way. They don't know Him like we do. They could never know Him like that. But they know Him. They know of Him. They know who He is. And Paul, the thought is, I don't want to just know Him like that. Anybody can know Him like that. You can do a philosophical study and know Him like that. And yet your heart cannot be changed. But I want to know Him. I want to know Him where it will make a difference in my life. I want to know Him. The power of His resurrection. The fellowship of His sufferings. That doesn't mean that we have to go through all the sufferings that Christ did. It means that we identify with the sufferings of Jesus. To identify with him in his sufferings and to be made conformable unto his death. How in the world can be be made conformable unto his death? There again, we can identify with him. We can go down in that grave, as it were, sanctification, be raised up in glory. It's like baptism. We go down. All of our sins, all of our sinful life goes down, buried. And we're raised up in newness of life to walk in Him, to know Him, to be identified with Him. Not just in the good part, but all of it's really good, but the sufferings, the being made conformable to His death. And then in that way, I'll know Him in the power of His resurrection. If Jesus had not suffered and died, He would never have known the glory of resurrection. But because He was willing to suffer and die on a cruel, rugged cross... That way he could be raised again in power and glory. And he could give life to all those who believe. Our first section is about recognizing the risen Christ. And these scriptures come from John chapter 20. It was very early on that first resurrection morn. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb and finds the stone taken away. How in the world did that big stone get taken away? The angel of God came and rolled that stone away. You'd think the Lord chose an angel with great big arms and big muscles. But you know what? He chose one with little bitty arms because you say, well, how in the world do you know? Well, I don't really know, no. But he chooses one with little arms because he's in effect saying it's not by might nor by power anyway, but it's by my spirit. And he goes there and he rolls that stone away just like it was a feather. And that stone is taken away. And she sees it there. The stone is taken away. And he's 
gone. He's not there. Well, she runs and tells Peter and John, they have taken away the Lord out of the grave, and we don't know where they have laid him. Peter and John, they take off, they run to the grave and find it empty, except for the grave clothes. The grave clothes are left behind as evidence that he's risen from the dead. Both disciples saw and actually went into the sepulcher one after another. And John, he also believed. He saw and he believed. If you're presented with the evidence of the resurrection, there's nothing else to do but believe. You've got to decide to believe or not to believe. They return to their own home, but Mary stays at the grave weeping, looking into the sepulcher as she does so. This brings us to our printed text in verse 12. And she sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Now this is a sacred time. It's a resurrection day, holy, Easter, whatever you want to call it. But I must say with my nature that the angels ask her a question that nobody can answer. Woman, what are you crying about? Nobody can answer that question. Don't you look at me like you can. I know you can't. Nobody can. You ask a woman why she's crying. She don't know. Peter don't know. John don't know. I don't know. The Lord don't know. The devil don't know. Nobody knows. Whoo! Why are they crying? Woman, what are you crying about? Why are you weeping? Well, actually, it's a simple question to answer because she said they've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where they put him. I do not know where he is. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. He was standing right there with her, and she didn't even know it. Somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's always there. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. We try to figure it out. We try to work it out. Just tell me if you've taken him somewhere. Tell me where he is, and I'll take him away. And while we try to figure these things out and reason these things out, the Lord is standing right there with us, patiently waiting for us to get through with all of our human reasoning where he can just say, here I am, I got it all worked out. And you ever been through those situations? I know you have. I'm just smiling when I think about it and asking you about it. You been to those situations? Lord, what in the world are we going to do? How in the world are we going to make it? Then when he brings you through, you look back and say, man, that wasn't so hard, was it? Oh, God's so good about that, isn't he? He brings us through things. And then we look back and say, Lord, what in the world was wrong with me? Why didn't I trust you more? Why wasn't I more patient to you? Why didn't I listen to your spirit more? And he said, that's all right. Just keep on trucking. We'll do better next time. That's the way Peter was. He didn't ever get on to Peter. What in the world was wrong with you, boy? He just said, why do you doubt? He reached out and he got him, and he took him back into the boat, and everything was all right. We condemn ourselves so much more than Christ condemns us. He doesn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. They've taken him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, when he calls her name, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, when he calls your name, it makes everything all right. All the times that you can know and remember when he called your name. You say, I may not have ever heard him speak audibly. You probably don't want to because if he did, he'd probably scare you to death. Or maybe scare you to life. I don't know. But anyway, he'd scare you one way or the other. But if he speaks, you'll know it. And he speaks your name. How many times have he called your name and said, it's going to be all right. You're going to make it. Everything's going to be all right. She comes and tells the disciples that she has seen the Lord, that he has spoken to her. She recognized the risen Christ. And we can recognize him today. We haven't been to the garden tomb. Some of us have been there physically, but most of us will never see that place. But we can recognize the risen Lord. We know that he lives. And we know that he's real. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. Just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. 
He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives within my heart. You can know the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. You can know the resurrected Lord. You can have a relationship with the risen Christ. You don't have to take your mama's word for it. You don't have to take your uncle's word for it. You don't even have to take the preacher's word for it. You can know the risen Christ yourself. And from Luke chapter 24, later on that same day, two of them went to a village called Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. Well, they were sad and they were talking about the things that had happened, the heartbreaking events of the past few days. They were walking along together. And Jesus himself joins them, but they don't recognize who he is. Jesus questions them as, what are they talking about? Why are you so sad as you walk and talk together? Oh, you must be a stranger here. Surely you know about the things that are happening, have been happening here for the past few days. And he said, what kind of things? They have crucified the Lord. These things about Jesus, this mighty man, wonderful man, of prophet, he's a mighty in word and deed. But we trusted that he was the one who should have redeemed Israel out of all their troubles and restored the kingdom to Israel. We thought surely he was the one. And beside all this, today is the third day since all these things were done. There are even reports of women who have seen him alive. We sent men to check it out. and They found the empty grave all right, but they didn't see him. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? It was necessary again that he suffer these things and to enter into his glory. And the way that he entered into his glory is because of the resurrection. Experiencing the resurrection. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Oh, how wonderful it was to have heard him talk as they walked together. And he expounded unto them in all things the scriptures concerning himself. You know, most of the time when we talk about ourselves, our head gets bigger and bigger and people get more impatient and more impatient. They want to get away from us because somebody who talks about themselves all the time, it's like three kind of people they like, you know, me, myself, and I. And they like to get away from people like that as best they can and as quick as they can. But here Jesus talks about himself, no conceit, no grandiosis, none of that. Oh, he just tells us how it is. And his word reveals to us who he is. And then you pick up, of course, with your printed text in verse 28. They drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. It came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake and gave to them. This is the same thing that happened when he was alive. The Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper, communion, whatever you want to call it, he did the same thing there that he does now. He takes the bread, he blesses it, gives thanks, he breaks it, and he gives to them. The four things that he does to the bread, he takes it, he blesses it, he parts it, breaks it, and he gives it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Oh, they recognized then who he was. There, the same one that had walked and talked with them. And many times he's been with us throughout our life, but we didn't even know who he was. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Oh, what a wonderful time it was. They communed with each other and they said our heart burned within us as he talked with us, and as he expanded to us the scriptures. They went immediately back to Jerusalem and found the disciples gathered together, and they were excitedly reporting and saying that the Lord was risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon Peter. And the two relate their story as to how Jesus walked and talked with them and how they recognized him in the breaking of bread. So there again, 
we can have a relationship with the risen Christ. We can know him. We don't have to take anybody else's word for it. We can know him ourselves. And I thank God that it's a personal relationship that you can have with Jesus. You don't have to take the preacher's word for it. And that may sound like a redundancy of statement. And you should believe a preacher when he tells you the truth. You should believe the Bible when you read it. And of course it tells you the truth. But you don't have to just take someone else's word for it. You can know it yourself. Some people don't want to put their faith and trust in Christ because they know that if they do, then they don't have a leg to stand on. They cannot stay in their sins in the world. And they know it's true, but they just don't want to come out. Oh, but you'll be so blessed if you do. You'll be so blessed. There's nothing in this world to hang on to that will cause you to rob yourself, your eternal soul of eternal life. It's so important that we have a relationship with the risen Christ. That's the only way that you can get to heaven. There was no plan A, B, and C. We've talked about some of that. Us have talked about it before. No plan B. This is it. There's only one way. It's not the Pentecostal way, the Baptist way, the Methodist way. It's the Jesus way. And the Jesus way happens to work out to be the full gospel way. But it's salvation. And salvation... Oh, when you get saved and when you're born again. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. That's the only way. It's not this new ecumenical way, this new liberalism way that says, all these rivers of religion, they'll lead you into one big ocean of God. Yeah, they'll lead you into an ocean of hell. That's where they'll lead you to, into a big ocean or lake of fire. You want to go to a lake, that's what it's going to be, that lake of fire. That's where they'll lead you to. But Jesus Christ will lead you all the way from earth to glory. Amen. He'll take you to heaven to be with Him, and you'll be with Him forever. And then you know the risen Christ, and you have a relationship with Him just like these two did. They knew Him. They had trusted that He was the one, and He reassured them, appeared to them. There was with them, but they didn't know it was Him. And then when he broke the bread, they recognized he was there with them all the time. And he gave them the assurance that they needed. So here, not only do we have a relationship with the risen Christ, and we recognize him and we have a relationship with him, but we can be restored by the risen Christ. And this is from John chapter 21. Jesus showed himself to some of the disciples as they were fishing at the Sea of Tiberias. And he calls out to them from the shore, and they, of course, could see him. Have you caught anything? Jesus asks. No, they answer. And he tells them to cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you will. And they did. And we're surprised by a great, big old, huge catch of 153 fish. Boy, that would make any fisherman happy. They've never seen so many fish in their bald-headed life, I'm sure. But man, they were so surprised to have it. It's the Lord, John exclaims, and they knew without a doubt that it was He. They joined Jesus on the shore who already had fish and bread upon the fire. And that old song, come and dine, the Master's calls, come and dine. And he, he invites them to come and dine. They enjoy a wonderful meal together. Bring the fish that you've caught and put it all together. And for everybody, there were so many didn't even have to worry about picking the bones. You had enough where you could just kind of go a little bit of splurging, you know. And they enjoyed that meal together. Jesus already had fish and bread on the fire. He already has what you need. But he'll allow you to use what you bring to him. Bring it to the master. And he'll use it for the glory of God. He'll use it for the kingdom of God. In verse 15 through 17, he talks after the meal when... They had dined. He talks now to Simon Peter. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And it's hard to translate some of this. It's there in English. We can just read it and believe it. But is he talking about more than the fish? Is he, do you love me more than these old fish? Do you love me more than the rest of the disciples? Nobody really knows. But he, he just asked him the question. Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, 
son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now you can go through all the tenses. You can go, and I've heard preachers, I've heard teachers do it. They take the New Testament Greek words, and Jesus said, Do you agapos me? Do you love me? Do you agapos me? And then the third time, Do you fellow me? And Peter says, Yes, Lord, you know that I fellow you. You know that I fellow you. You know that I love you. And you can go through all that, but just think about the English word love. It doesn't matter whether you say phileo, whether you say agape, and there are different words for love in Greek. But love is love. We know what love is. After all, you think about this, and I smile again when I think about it because these people talk about the New Testament Greek, and a brother and I was talking about New Testament Greek before, and it's all right. You look at the words and all, you look at the translation. If you can do that, that's all right to do that. But if you've got a Bible in English, why do you want a Spanish Bible if you don't read Spanish? Why do you want a Greek Bible if you don't read Greek? Why do you want a Hebrew Bible if you don't read Hebrew? you got an English Bible that's written in your language. Why don't you just go ahead and believe what God gives you to believe? you got it written there before you. He said, just, just love me. Do you love me? He said, yeah, I love you. But what I'm smiling about, was thinking about, was Jesus wasn't talking no Greek. Peter wasn't talking no Greek. They were talking Hebrew or Aramaic to each other. They were not talking to Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek, and certainly it's a value to us. But they were not saying phileo. They were not saying agape. They were just saying love. In Hebrew, whatever it is, they were saying love. I love you. Do you love me? Do you care for me? Do you really love me? And he assured him by saying it three times. Once, twice, three times. If he calls you, look how many times he calls Samuel. Samuel, Samuel, he runs to the old man. Did you call me? No, I didn't call my son. And he calls him over and over. And thank God that he doesn't give up on us by calling us just one time. If he had called us one time and we wouldn't answer, we'd be in hell today. But he never gave up. He keeps on calling us. Jesus kept on and he assured Peter that everything was all right. That's the way he dealt with him. and That's why he brought him to that point. Do you really love me? Oh yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He gave him the same command and invitation he now gives to us with a simple two-word phrase, follow me. The same thing that he said to them in the beginning. When he saw them there at the Sea of Galilee, when Andrew found Peter, brought him to the Lord, what did Jesus said the same thing? Follow me. Found James and John, follow me. And that's what he says to us. He might have said, come. He might have said, get saved. He might have said, be born again. He might have said, this is your last chance. I've heard all kind of testimonies that said that he said all kind of things, but actually what he said to us, he still says the same thing today, follow me. Experiencing the resurrection. Lord, I thank you for a simple gospel that works. I thank you for the word of God that's alive. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us this opportunity to love Jesus. And I pray today that you would help us to experience the resurrection in a greater and more personal way than ever before. And may we reach out with the gospel of salvation to help others experience Jesus too, to be saved, to be born again, to be sanctified, to be baptized in the Spirit, to be healed, and all the wonderful blessings of God that you have for us. You died and rose again so that we could be saved and have eternal life and live in heaven forever and ever. We ask these things in praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to a teaching session from God's Anointed Word. The title has been Experiencing the Resurrection. Be sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. That way you will indeed experience His wonderful resurrection. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.